Hey you guys, this is Josh. And Carolyn. With Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat, Food for Thought. This week we're going to talk about how many animals you need to raise for a year's worth of meat. And right. how to figure it out. And that is not how much meat. We've got another Pantry Chat on that you can check right. out. This is how many animals you need to get to that amount of meat. Yeah, we'll help you work through the equation because it is kind of a math equation, isn't it? It, it really is, and it's, it's actually kind of fun to do, and it really helps you uh, get your homestead dialed in and knowing ahead what you need to raise and plan, and of course you'll blend that with what you can raise and what you want to raise, depending on your land and your wishes, but it's, it's really a, a, um, a fun way to go that helps you kind of dial in what you're raising for yourself. Well, and even if you aren't raising the animals yourself, this is going to help you know what you need to bring in from a local farmer. If you're mm -hmm. buying a whole or a half animal, it's going to really give you a picture of your meat consumption for the year if you're trying to get ahead and buy that bulk or raise it yourself. So it's not only for people who are raising them themselves, but just to give you a good picture of what you need to purchase even. Sure, or if you're even looking at land and you're thinking about, you yeah. know, I want to raise animals, I want to raise all my own meat. Well, if you know how much meat you need to raise, you can know how many animals you need based on what we're going to talk about today, which can help you look at land. And that's a different conversation, but how many animals can you raise on that mm. land? What kinds? What is even going to help you think ahead if you're looking to buy property eventually and you want an idea like how much land do I need in order to provide all of my meat for my family? Hey, that sounds like a good follow-up pantry chat. I sure think we does. better talk about that okay. one soon. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get to it. But for today, for today, we'll get to that in just a moment. Of course, we're going to always check in a little bit, see how things are going, and answer a question. So, um, how are things going? What's up with you? Oh, things are going well. Just humming along in January. You know, it's almost it's, over already. Uh, can you believe that? Almost over. We're actually filming this a little bit early, and one of the things we are facing right now is well, we've just come through a really large winter storm. Um, we got what would you say, eighteen inches of snow in about forty-eight hours, mm. maybe a little bit more. Yeah, 16, maybe 18 Yeah. Um, in the last couple of days. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's been a lot of fun. Homestead's really taken that very well, aside from a little extra plowing that the guys have been doing to keep the driveways clear and the walkways clear. Um, but what we're really facing coming up here is some pretty severe negative temperatures on the forecast. For us. Now, our Canadian friends are going to laugh yeah. at us. That we think this is severe, or, or maybe our friends in Minnesota, but um, For it's pretty us, cold. We're looking at some lows that are around negative 24 degrees Fahrenheit, and one day in particular where we're not even coming out of the negatives as a high during the daytime. Negative four is the high. Wow, I saw like three days. <clears throat> three, uh, where the highest they were was definitely hovering three. like around zero and yeah. somewhere in there. That's the, cold for us. That's cold. That gets to be really cold and that starts needing some special considerations on the homestead. One, keeping the fire going. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. that means we have to actually get up in the middle of the night to keep the fire going because there is yep. no backup heat in our house at the moment. So <laughs> love, we, love wood. We like our wood and it's a good thing it's there, but sometimes you have to nurture it along a little bit more. Yeah. And then what about the animals? Um, mostly it's just managing the water, our animal mm -hmm. system. Our animals are great. Animals are hardy. Uh, you know, what they need is just shelter and protection from wind. And by shelter, I mean they just need something a little bit over them and protection from wind. Uh, pigs need a little bit more. Cows and sheep can actually stay in it if they've got low spot to get into a tree. So they often animals... prefer staying in it. Like you'll give oh, them a do. nice barn, nice cozy oh, yeah. spot, and you'll come out and they'll all be out in the weather. Yeah, the cows are out in the barnyard, <laughs> even in the snow and cold like this. Um, but mostly it's just uh, water, keeping mm -hmm. keeping the water, um, you know, de-iced. And we have de-icers, um, but even in that kind of weather, sometimes it's slower. Or of course, you know, it always happens, things fail. You know, so de-icers start failing when it gets really cold. So that's probably our biggest challenge, but we're, we're pretty squared away and ready for it. And um, snow, the, the amount of snow is the biggest challenge because it creates a lot of plowing. And up where we're at, it creates a lot of power outages. So right. that's been one of the things I've been managing for the last couple of days a little bit more is uh, the, the inside of the house with like power going off and then them restoring power. And then an hour later, it goes off again. <laughs> like we kind of had a, a day yesterday of a lot of power on and off, on and off. Luckily, we have generators to be able to switch on and, and kind of power up all the crucial systems. 
Um, but it does require watching some lighting and, you know, yeah. some backup battery lighting and things like that. Especially if you're, um, we don't have an inline where it comes on and off automatically. Mm, that's, that'd be nice. that, that'll be the next stage coming. Um, so you got to go in and go out, turn it on. And power comes back right. on, and yeah, and, uh, and so we had one of those, or you had one of those days. I was I was in town, um, where you just got to mess with that. But yeah. you know, it's nice. It's nice to be very set. Even that, everything's taken care of well, and uh, we upgraded our generators this year yes. to where they actually are turnkey. Yay! So that Carolyn and the girls, particularly, if all of its guys were gone, weren't out there trying to pull start an old motor that just you know got its quirks, doesn't want to go right away, and they're getting frustrated. So. Um, got some new Honda motors with a key start, and I, I know that was that makes it a lot easier to manage. It's that. a huge difference when all of a sudden yeah. you can just make something work without fighting it. Yeah, it, it's a big yeah. difference. So a little bit of a luxury, but it's very very nice and on the step towards an eventual inline backup system. So aside from the weather around here, I've just been uh, getting into a little bit of garden planning, starting to think about seed starts and mm -hmm. going through seeds, making sure we have what we need. We're still, we still haven't sat down and done all of our planning like we normally would have done, but we are going to do it here. Well, soon. for us, it's generally not too hard because our, our garden, we you know, we're going into our fifth garden year here and On this obviously property. Our, yep. our like 18th garden year in general mm -hmm. as a couple. Um, 18th, 19th or more. And um, so we generally kind of know where we're headed uh, in what we're doing and the way the garden maps out. Though we're talking about a few changes this year to simplify a little bit. So still got to button that down. <laughs> Lots of planning to do. And I think aside from that, we're just kind of buckling down on homeschooling. We kind of talked about that last time, doing a little more homeschooling, a little mm -hmm. more organization projects in the house. Uh, some some organizing areas to get them a little bit more efficient, a little cleaner. Last time you noted the back wall over here, and I've got to say it is a little bit better, but it's not totally organized at this cool. point. So we're getting there. But January, February seem to be the real time for that, yeah. where we can really dial it in. Yeah. But what about you? What have you been up to? Well, you know, we really kind of covered it, I think. Yeah. Uh, plowing's taking more time. We've yeah. got a bit of property, you know, two houses to get to and barn access. And and we don't have to do all that much. But, you know, I kind of live by the, the idea that if something can go wrong, it will. So I try to keep things plowed pretty well when we've right. got heavy snow. Um, just that we have access everywhere. If we got a vet, you know, if we got an animal emergency, we need to get a vet in. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, we could just walk back and forth to the barn. But... Um, same with vehicles in and out. So plowing takes up a bit of time and yeah, just kind of planning and and uh, cruising along here. The January thinking, sorts of thinking things. Thinking about 2024 <laughs> and what are we going to do? That's the other discussion we haven't had yet is we actually just had our homestead huddle, ah. which is where we get together with everybody in the family and talk about what's, what, what's working, what's not working, what are particular interests, what would people like to do. Um, what should we do more of and get everybody's input on systems that are working, not working well, need improvement? Do we need to abandon something? So we just kind of did that and now it's time for you and I to synthesize a bit and look at that. Kind of plan the year based on some of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and then also our big projects. I mean, we've got pantry chats on this as well on, yeah. on How to planning plan. and uh, dialing in our big projects so that we set goals that might push us a little bit but that are doable. Right. Uh, and, and not overly stressful, which is what we tend to do is uh, create more work and, <laughs> and get stressed. <laughs> but you would think sitting down with all of the kids and asking them, you know, what should we, is there anything we should do less of or not do? Being that they, you know, they do chores around here. They make this homestead run in a lot of ways. They do a lot of the work. And so you would think that they would be like, oh, let's just, you know, go to the grocery store and buy canned food and get our chicken from mm -hmm. the grocery store and not do any of these. And when we asked that question, they were like, no, <laughs> we got to keep doing it all. Yeah, I even suggested, <laughs> are there any animals that we need to take out of the yeah. loop? And there were an individual here and there that maybe would be happy to do without a particular animal breed. Right. But by and large, the group was like, no, we need those. No, we like our lamb, yeah. you know, this or that. And that was really, really cool. Yeah. I guess it was else was really cool and going through that that the kids brought up is that they actually ask to watch less tv they did now we don't watch a lot of tv as far as whatever normal goes but mm -hmm. when winter time comes it's time for rest and and so we tend to watch a little more in the evenings and it's usually you know something learning or something light spread out with a little bit of entertainment and um, but sometimes mom and dad are a little tired and default tired to what's easy <laughs> 
And uh, the kids, all of them, actually said, can we do less TV and do more reading or more activities or more things? And I just, I was so proud of that and just how cool yeah. that was that they were asking us but, to do less. That, that's pretty cool because you and I were both raised in front of a TV. Yeah, a lot and of TV. And so, you know, for us, when things get, when we get tired, when we get stressed, yeah, it's easy that's to the default easy to. default. Yeah, because let's that's put on YouTube we, and yeah. learn learn some homesteading stuff, or yeah. you know something we like, or watch an animal channel. Is right. One of our things to do. Yeah, we're very selective about what we watch, but sometimes we can watch more of it, yeah. especially in the winter, than even we would like. And so, kind of neat to see them who have not they have not been raised in front of a TV nearly as much, and yeah. they're kind of going. Uh, too much screen time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because that's coming from the older ones that are doing school, and they do school yes, on their computers. They do. Because um, that's more efficient, and that, and that works well. And um, so they're like, no, nah, I've had enough screen time for today. I want to do something else in the evening. So that's very good. neat. That, that just, I was proud of that and them for that. Okay. Well, we're chatty today, and we have a big topic to yep. cover. So let's get to a question of the day. Sounds good. It looks like this question is from... Uh, 1 Peter 477, on a whole year's worth of lard in one day. Let me okay. say that again. A whole year's worth of lard in one day. Right. It's an older video. Why is rendered lard not a botulism risk? Ah, good question. The jars seal, even though they aren't canned, so there's somewhat of an oxygen-free environment present. Correct? Yes. This is a really good question because, you know, you take that lard and uh, the rendered lard, and you can seal that in a jar. You seal it just because it's hot when you put it in there so it naturally seals. And of course, we're told all the time, don't just seal the jar and put it on the shelf. You know, you have to actually process it. Mm -hmm. The thing with lard is that it's all fat. And I know it's easy to look at fat and think of it as moisture, but it really isn't. There isn't a water content. It has pretty much zero water content in it. Botulism needs at least 14% water content in order to actually thrive, like live and survive. So when you have properly rendered lard that you've rendered out all of the liquid in, all of that water in, um, then botulism cannot survive in that environment. So it's actually, uh, fat is actually a very safe medium to uh, store things in, to preserve food in. That's why they used to do um, like potted meats where you would cook the meat in the fat and then you would store it. You can still do that, it's actually mm -hmm. really good, but then you store it covered in fat mm -hmm. and that seals it in because you've kind of rendered out all of that liquid. Now you have to do it the right way in order to make it safe. We're gonna learn that one day. But, um, but we have actually done a little bit mm -hmm. of it in the kitchen, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, and a good way to store some meat, but that's why it's safe is because it has no moisture in there. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to get to the subject of the day, but I want to address something real quick first. Okay. And that is that some of you called out that I came to the pantry chat a little underdressed a couple of weeks ago. So I am what? sorry. Please forgive me. I was without my hat. <laughs> and so I was he not, does, he does I was have not hair. properly dressed. I do. It's not because I'm bald. Uh, we have heard speculation that it's because you have no hair that no, uh, you wear a hat. I get a little self-conscious about my forehead, but um, <laughs> anyways... Redmond noticed nice that I was without my hat, and they sent me a nice shiny new hat. All right. And uh, if you guys aren't familiar with Redmond, <laughs> make sure and check them out. Salt is integral to our life, to our animal health. Oh, that's funny. And we love Redmond. Everything that's cool. else. They sent you a hat. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, sporting my new Redmond hat, and uh, I will be careful to come properly dressed to the pantry chats in the future. That's good. We've used Redmond salt for. Near 20 years. I think 20 years, and I just, I love that stuff. Yeah, I do too. I've become uh, friends with a couple people there, and just a great, great product. It is yeah. really, in our opinion, you can get lots of good quality salt, but Redmond's all American made, and it is uh, American harvested, you know, whatever, but it's done well, it's real, and it's good quality. Just so you guys know, this isn't a sponsor spot. <laughs> Redmond hasn't paid us to say anything about it. No, not at all. We just, but, we really yeah. like Redmond. It's the yep. salt that we prefer Absolutely. to use. Absolutely. And we love sharing the things that we like, yeah. so... Cool. All righty. How many animals do you need to raise in a year to fill your freezer with the meat that you need? Right. Wow. This is a big topic because I know we have talked before about how much, how to figure out how much meat you need. And we'll touch on that really lightly again today. But you can check out the other pantry chat on that. Yeah, we'll the, put that in the description. This, this video mostly assumes that you know my family as a whole needs, you know, 1,500 pounds of meat for a right. year in total. Yeah. 
So taking that number then though mm -hmm. and translating that into, so what does that mean for how many animals I need to raise or how many animals I need to buy from the rancher or the farmer, um, you know, becomes a whole next step. And when you start breaking these things down, it actually becomes very formulaic and it, it helps you to think through things. It becomes much easier when you first start switching over from buying buy the cut meat mm -hmm. in the grocery store, thinking about purchasing a year's worth of meat is like mind blowing, right? Yeah. Like how do I figure this out? How do I arrange it? How do I store it? All these different things. But then when you want to take it a step further and you're like, okay, now I want to raise this meat all by myself. Like what does that translate into, into animals? Um, that, that can be a very like feel very overwhelming to try to figure mm -hmm. that out. So we're going to demystify that whole process for you today. Absolutely. It's a little bit of guesswork and a lot of math, but, yeah. but it will really give you some confidence moving forward. Well, and I want to say right now, there will be a blog post just about this. So if you're the kind of person who you're hearing the math and you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I could see this in written form, check out the show notes. We will make sure to have a link for you there so you can actually see it in writing. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. All right. All right, so where to start? You know you need X amount of meat in a year. I think our examples is one for our own family, which is a little over 1,500 pounds. Um, that's probably high for most people. Uh, we'll get to another example that's uh, a little bit less than that, more like 625 pounds. Um, where to start? So we're going to start with poultry yep. and chickens because, one, it's, it's something that's easy for people to raise. It's a good place to start raising mm -hmm. your own meat, and there's two ways to go. Um, you can just figure out per bird how much you need, mm -hmm. which is what we're going to tackle here. Meaning I'd like to eat one chicken per week for my household. Right. And so you go per bird instead of poundage. Right. And that's, that's about it, right? Like right. how much chicken do you need? You need one bird, you need three birds a week mm -hmm. times 52. And that tells you how many birds that you need to raise. Give yourself some padding on that number. You will lose animals somewhere, right. especially with meat chickens. So, you know, 15%, 10, 15% padding, and then round up <laughs> to give yourself right. a little bit of room in that process. But based on like that number, like I need a thousand pounds overall, mm -hmm. you need to kind of be able to estimate each chicken is average five pounds. Mm -hmm. Therefore, do the math, take that out of your thousand. Yeah. So you do need to do that math. The other way you can figure poultry is figure it into the equation that we're going to go through next as your overall meat source, which we'll go through. That's another way to do it. But but just usually no. Like that's how Carolyn figures it. Usually no. We yeah. need a chicken a week or we need three chickens a week. For us, it's three chickens a week at least right now. And then round up a little bit right. <laughs> for our large family. Yeah. Okay. So you... In this, if you pull out the chicken count because you're just doing it by bird, um, because that's that's an easy way to think about it if you're in the kitchen. Which goes to like by day, right, is what that leads to? It is by day. Well, like how much chicken right. per week right. you Right, so want. you're eating chicken one day a week. Oh, by day, yeah. Le so leading. one day, right. yeah. One day out of the week, two days out of the week, how often, how, of how much chicken do you need then right. to get through one day? And then how many days a week do you want to eat it? And then go ahead and multiply that out. Right. Yeah. And then that's going to lead you to your total meat weight minus chicken based on what we're talking about here. Okay. So wait, sorry, I was still summing up poultry. Here. Okay. So you're talking about for knowing how much meat you need in general, you want to look at how much you're going to eat in a day, right? Right. That, that's pretty the basic way to do it. And then you're going to multiply that out by how many weeks and... How many months, <laughs> right. you know, get yourself to that, how much you need per day, but over the whole year for your whole family. Right. So and that gives you that total. It gives you, you that X meat amount total. of meat. Yeah. So, right. right. So a few things to know here. There's a few terms before we get into the math. Okay. That you want Good. to understand. These are important terms to know because as you start figuring out your weight, um, you realize that the, that meat weight that you're thinking about, like I need three pounds a day to get my family through. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, hey, well, then I need to raise three pounds of meat right. over oh. here, right? Because there's a lot of different things that happen in the processing of getting that animal to that cut and package weight. A live animal weighs much more than what you get in the freezer once that animal's been processed. Right. So we need to talk about three things. Okay. Live weight hanging weight, and cut weight. Okay. 
Those are the three different things. So live weight is obviously what it sounds like. It is the live weight of the animal before it has been slaughtered right. or cleaned or anything's been done to it. Right, and knowing averages and live weight is gonna be real key to some of the, the math on things we're gonna do here. Okay, so we'll talk about those yep. averages in a minute. Right. Next is hanging weight. Hanging weight is after the animal has been killed and has been eviscerated. That means it's been gutted, its skin's been taken off, usually its head has been taken off, and that's that hanging weight. That's what's actually gonna get cut up into your cuts of meat. And so it's important to know hanging weight. You often get uh, charged from the butcher based on hanging mm -hmm. weight, a few different things like that. But again, that's not what goes into your freezer. Yeah, you still have some right. more loss yeah. coming up from that. There are some places in the country that refer to this as hot carcass weight. That's like the technical industrial term. Right. Some custom butchers use that. So if you hear that, just know that that is what we're calling hanging weight. Right. Yeah, and some of these have different like terms in different areas. Yeah, of the and I'm sure we're not familiar with all of the, yeah. the terminology in different places, but hanging weight's the most common. We, we've lived in several different places around the country, talked to a lot of people, and, and so hanging weight's what you'll generally hear from a custom butcher. Okay. Yep. Then your final weight here is your cut weight. Right. And that is the, if you take all the little nice white packages that you're gonna get back from the butcher and you add all those up, that is your cut weight. And that's that, like how much meat do you need for a year, right? right? That's your cut weight. You might hear it as your take home, your packaged weight, mm -hmm. your cut and wrap weight. There Again, there's even more terminology for that, but we're gonna to refer to it as cut weight here today. And that is actually what's getting you to that I need X amount of meat a year is your cut weight. So the real trick here is trying to figure out the difference between that live weight mm -hmm. and that cut weight so that you can kind of reverse engineer it and be like, hey, this is how much cut weight I need at the end of the day to feed my family for a year. Right. So how much live weight do I need? Now, luckily there's some industry standards, mm -hmm. some, you know, we got to say right off the top, all the numbers in this are average, standard, uh, you know. You, well, we have, we have to have a way numbers. to talk about it, right? right. We got to have a way to talk about it. So they're averages. And, they're, and I'll, yeah. as we go through them, I'll talk a little bit about the fluctuations. But, okay. but they are averages, and this is going to help you understand, you know, if you're raising an animal, it's an average cow, you kind of know what its general live weight is, you can, you can do some percentages here. Okay. So we're going to cover the three main animals All right. that people are doing, right? Beef, pork, and lamb. Okay, good. So if you have your animal, your beef, and it, it's, you have its live weight, you can expect about 46%, is that a 46? Sorry, that's 41. So 41, sorry. Sloppy writing. 41% <laughs> of that live weight to end up in your freezer as your cut weight. Right, so if you have say a thousand pound cow steer, mm -hmm. um, about 410 pounds of that is going to be packaged meat in your freezer. Okay. So a few caveats, we'll get to that in a moment because it, it kind of goes across all animals. Okay, yeah. sounds good. So pork. So pork, you have a higher yield with pork mm -hmm. and you're gonna get about 53% of your live weight into those cut packages. Yep. And then with the lamb, you're gonna get a much lower percent, percentage. We'd say lamb venison would be kind of the same. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about hunting and bringing deer, mm -hmm. elk in, mm -hmm. um, then with lamb, you're looking at more like 35% right. of your live weight ends up in your freezer. Right. Now, a few things that affect this. One is just the breed of animal and it will fluctuate between mm -hmm. breeds, even meat breeds, so it, it can go up and down a little bit. Most of these, I'd say, are probably the low end. You're probably not gonna do much lower than that unless you have an unhealthy animal or unless you disclude a lot of bones, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay. okay? So this is probably the low end. So there's the breed of animal. There's how the animal is finished, mm -hmm. how it was raised and finished. Is it fully filled out and finished properly, right? The more properly it's finished and aged, aged on the hoof as far as being alive and taken to maturity, <laughs> that's gonna increase that a little bit, as is how you cut and wrap. I, we have had the experience of when we do it ourselves in our own home, we get a much higher yield. It's mm -hmm. just kind of the way it is. You're yeah. dealing with your own, you're not gonna waste anything. Yeah. But when you send it off to the butcher, you also have uh, variables in, right. how, in your cut list 
and what you might want back that are going to affect that yield number. Yeah. So the other one is just bones, and depending on how you cut it up will determine how many bones are in it. And when we're talking about this, because we're coming from a home saving perspective, we're assuming there are bones in there. So we are often taking cuts that might have a higher percentage of bone weight mm -hmm. than, say, store-bought meat. And so when we're figuring our, our household need over the years, say, 1,500 pounds, we're figuring there are bones in that, mm -hmm. and so some bones, like yeah, not, well, all some, the bones, not all the bones, not all the bones, but some bones. Yeah. Um, so that's that's just important to understand because that is going to push your weight up a bit. Right. So when you're talking B, 41 percent, that's the low end. It can be up to 50 percent, sometimes even a little bit higher. Uh, pork, the same. It can be 60 percent, a little bit higher. And lamb, to me, in my experience, has been a little more variable. Sometimes it's actually lower. Um, sometimes it can be a little higher, but I'd say the lamb number is probably closer mm -hmm. uh, to reality. But know that these are these are rules of thumb, they're <laughs> guidelines, but they'll get you there. They'll get your planning. And then as you do this for a year or two, you'll get to where you just start to know and it starts to work out. But right. but this really helps get you going if you go by that uh, those percentages. Okay, so let's say we now know how much meat we need to end up with in our freezer, mm -hmm. pound-wise. And we understand the difference between the live weight and our cut weight and how to figure that percentage based on the percentages we just gave you. Mm -hmm. What is our next step for figuring out how to figure how many animals we need or what animals we need mm -hmm. um, from, from that knowledge? So uh, the, the thing that you can do is kind of take a rule of thumb that says um, a third of the live weight in actual meat. So reverse engineer that. If you need a thousand pounds, and I'm just using a thousand because it's easy it's on easy math, enough. right? <laughs> if you need a thousand pounds of meat in the, in the home, then you're going to want about 3,000 pounds of live weight animal. And we'll, we'll get to breaking that down in a minute, but that's a, that's a very rough guideline. These percentages actually are higher than that, mm -hmm. but that kind of keeps it secure, keeps it safe, and makes sure that you're raising enough animal. It gives you a starting spot. Right. Gives that's you a starting spot. So in the example you just gave, let's say you need a thousand pounds of meat, you decide, okay, I'm gonna raise then, by that really rough rule of thumb, I'm gonna raise about 3,000 pounds of meat. Right. Remember, this is not including chickens. This does the not we, include way, chickens. This is why we broke this. out chickens yeah. at the beginning. Well, and a good reason for that is it's just live weight on chickens, we're not usually talking about it that way. Yeah. yeah. So, so now you say, okay, I need about 3,000 pounds of meat. Lightweight. Where do you go from there? Lightweight. So, well, you need to know what are the average size of animals if you're just getting your head around this, yeah. you know, and so you can do a little bit of math, right? So we've got some average, again, these are averages, these fluctuate. But and these are really based on commercial meat breeds. Mm -hmm. Just to tell you, if you're re raising like a heritage breed animal or something like that, you're probably going to expect a little bit smaller of a live weight. Yep. Um, so you want to, as you refine this process, you're going to want to really get into the exact breed of the animal that you're raising. And you'll be able to find averages for that yeah. breed. If you know you've got a breed that that's what you can buy locally, it's what you like, it's what works well in your land, just do the research and you can, you can plug and play in these numbers, mm -hmm. whatever you have. Any breeder, any research on the breed is going to tell you, you know, what the averages About are. About what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so average meat breed. So mm -hmm. lamb on average runs about 120 pounds. This is live weight, right? live weight. when they're finished, yeah. ready to go. Goats, which we're not really breaking down, but they're running um, about 60 pounds. Wow, okay. Yeah. I would have guessed they'd be a little heavier than that. Interesting. Mm. But I don't know goats well at all. <laughs> um, beef, 1,200 pounds. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a little on the high side for, for most heritage breeds. Um, and then pork, about 250 pounds. So that gives you, you, you can do some math right there. I need three I need 3,000 pounds of live weight. Right. And you could say, well, I'm going to do one beef at 1,200 pounds. I'm going to do four pork at 250 pounds. That's 2,200 pounds. And you need 800 more pounds. Do the math on the sheep. You need about six sheep there or something. Right. Right. And you can plug and play those numbers, and that starts to give you, uh, you know, an idea of what you need on the hoof on your land to get to that 1,000 pounds. So you can see how that becomes really kind of formulaic, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it really breaks it down into the formula. The kinds of animals that you choose are going to depend on what do you want to eat? What do you have room to, to raise? What do you have, you know, infrastructure for? What do you have access to with your local rancher that you want to buy meat from? But you can start saying, you know, look, I can only get beef. That's the only thing I have access to. Um, so I just want all beef. Well, you know you have that number 
that's going to help you dial in roughly about how many right. of each. Um, but you don't want to leave it at that rough number once you start dialing in this like, okay, maybe maybe I want, you know, two steer, four pigs, and one sheep. Yeah. Um, you don't want to leave it at that rough number that was based on that triple your your package weight or your cut weight. Right. You want to go back and run the actual percentages again. Remember the, the ones where we're talking about beef is 41%, uh, pork is 53%, and lamb is about 35%. And we'll, we'll, we'll run a couple scenarios here, but also you can do this based on what your wants are. Say you want to eat a diet that's about, you know... 30% beef and, mm -hmm. you know, 20% pork and, right. you know, 30% lamb and the rest chicken. You know, you can you can play with those numbers and come up with a percentage of your overall meat needs and work it that way. So right. there's a couple different ways to do this. But we're going to talk about our family. So for a family of 15, okay. um, we need about three chickens a week uh, for a day's worth of meals. So 52 times 3 is 156. Plus a little bit for loss. A little bit of padding. <laughs> bit of padding, so that gives us 172. Generally, you're rounding up, ordering by 25s and batches, so that's 175 chickens. All right. A year, right? No wonder we have a chicken full of freezer, a freezer full of chickens. Freezer full of chickens. <laughs> it's a good thing we don't have a chicken full of freezers. That would be bad. <laughs> Let's see. Now, for the rest of the time, we need about five pounds a day, and that's for six days a week. Because yep. we're covering that one day a week with chickens. So that's about 30 pounds a week times 52 is... Uh, 1,560 pounds of meat a year is what, what the cut weight. Don't a, don't panic. We have about we have 15 people generally at our table if we average it out. So right. this is probably not your scenario. You probably don't need the amount of number that Josh is about to say here. Right. So, I, just, so <laughs> I don't want you to panic. <laughs> so going by that rule of thirds, just to, to give us a rough draft, so you times that times three, that gives you 4,680 pounds of live animals. Um, you know, that are finished and ready to go to butcher. Okay, mm -hmm. so what do we need? Well, we've covered the 175 chickens. We're going for two 1,200-pound steers, four 250-pound pigs, and one 100-pound sheep. Right. Okay, that's going to get us to that live weight. Right about that live weight. Right, Good. and that breaks down real nicely. If you take those percentages I gave you, those two 1,200-pound steers are going to yield 984 pounds of beef, roughly. Right. Uh, the pork, it's gonna 530 pounds of pork, and the sheep, about 42 pounds of lamb. That gives us 1,556 pounds of meat right at our target there of, of 1,560. Very nice. Okay, but what about a more reasonable family of four? That's a, a much more normal situation who only wants to eat about one chicken a week for the family, and they want to consume about half a pound per person of meat per day on the remaining days of yep. the week. And don't freak out about the half pound. I know you might say, well, we don't need a half. We eat a third pound or a quarter pound. But remember, there's bones in there. There's a few different things. Average up a little bit. So... I, I think so a half pound is a good rule. Some people feel like that is light. Some people feel like it's heavy. Like people's yeah. preference is all over Kinda the place. Kind of depends yeah, how really your diet does. is, um, but but just round up. Mm -hmm. So sure, so that's 60 chickens. So that By ends up being, up. yeah, you round up a little yep. bit. So 60 chickens. Then that means you need 12 pounds a week times 52. That's 624 pounds of meat a year. Okay. okay? So we've broken this up with one steer at 1,200 pounds. So first let's do the... Oh, sorry. If yeah. we multiply, multiply that by three. three, then they're gonna end up needing 1,872 pounds of live finished animal. Right, which really isn't that much. We're talking four animals here when yeah. you break it down. One steer at 1,200 pounds roughly, two pigs at 250 pounds. You generally want two pigs anyways and one sheep at 120 pounds, go ahead and get the second sheep. They, they need a buddy. They need a buddy. <laughs> but for the sake of the math, that yields, you know, 504 pounds of beef, 132.5 pounds of, of pork, 42 pounds of lamb, getting us to a little over our goal, uh, 678 and a half pounds of meat for the year. Oh, good. So, so you're, you're right in there. All right. 
So that is a really rough way. And the fun thing about this is that you can start playing with the different types of animals that you want, right? right? To yeah. get you to that number. Let's say you're that same family and you say, you know, we don't eat pork or we're not interested in raising pigs this year. You can then say maybe you want that one 12 pounds, 1200 pound steer. Maybe you're planning on hunting and you're gonna bring in a couple of 150 pound deer. Mm -hmm. That's very reasonable and three 120 pound sheep. And that's yep. gonna get you up about to that total too. So that's where it's really cool because you can start to plug and play and you can even run different scenarios, mm -hmm. again, based on the land you have or based on land you're thinking about buying mm -hmm. or you know where it's at and you may your land may be better for sheep so you just need to do more sheep and you're gonna maybe buy half a steer hmm. you know yeah. right i mean there's just a whole lot of directions you can go with this to plug and play to help you confidently start out the year raising uh, what you need and you know it's not an exact science but this is going to get you very close and then you just adjust year over year Make sure you keep records of what you did, what your plan mm. was, yep. and then in retrospect, like how that worked for you. Like, oh, we ran out of chickens too soon, right. or we had way too much whatever. We didn't like it. And that way you can adjust in the following year. And, and same with your animals when you're butchering them. Try to know their weights, especially in the early years mm -hmm. when you're figuring this out. Try to make sure you know the live weight, you know the hanging weight. Um, a lot of times custom butchers don't give you the cut weight. That's one of the reasons I like doing mm -hmm. it at home. We weigh everything. Yeah. Um, but it's okay. You, you, you need to use a custom butcher. That just may be something you don't have time for. So you may just want to weigh it yourself if, if they don't weigh the packages. But yeah. keep those records. That really helps you figure it out. Yeah. Eventually, you get down the road. You know your land. You know your family's needs. And you're more just adjusting and going, oh, we're going to do a little less chicken this year. We're going we're gonna to do an extra lamb. Mm -hmm. Or, wow, you know, our beef... Something happened and, and we don't have one, or it's just smaller this year, it's younger, we gotta harvest it younger. All that allows you to adjust there you and go. plan. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, you guys. So just get out a pad of paper and a pencil and start scribbling away and figuring it all out. Again, there's a link to the blog post down below in the description if you wanna see all of those numbers again and how they work together. Um, that'll help you right there. And we'd love to hear the math for you. I'd love to know, like, yeah. how much meat does your family need for a year and what are you planning to raise or buy oh, to yeah. get there? What a fun discussion. So uh, drop that in the discussion if you'd like to. All right. It's been great hanging out with you. See you soon. Goodbye.